Morning, friends. I have had so much fun reading your comments this week. Please enjoy my stories or whatever else might be on my mind today. Last week I posted a video about the Code Napoleon, the criminal law in Mexico, and a um, small discussion about whether or not you're guilty until proven innocent or innocent until proven guilty. And uh, got quite a response. Lots of comments, lots of views. And uh, I just wanted to give you a couple of impressions about my take on the comments this morning. Number one, it reminded me of one long time ago and what seems like a galaxy far, far away when I was a teacher and would lecture students. And I always found it annoying that I would be talking about something and making a point, and I would give an example, and then the class discussion that ensued would be about the example and not about the point. Well, the point of my video last week was that in Mexico, things have changed, that unlike uh, years and years ago, when I told the story about a lady named Sandy and a floor polisher that she apparently stole, um, which was the example, and it was an example of what can happen under the Napoleonic Code of Law, where you are guilty until you're proven innocent. And I found it interesting in my research that uh, things have changed in Mexico from 1789, when the uh, French um, rights of man were passed, and the 2008 reform of the criminal code in Mexico, and the adoption of that in 2016, so that in fact you are uh, guaranteed in Mexico the presumption of innocence if you're charged with a crime. Well, that's what the minute video was about the presumption of innocence in Mexico. But, unlike back when I used to get annoyed about the example being the discussion instead of the point, happened again. <laughs> However, being older and hopefully wiser, uh, I'm most often now amused rather than annoyed. And uh, hundreds, hundreds of you talked about the example, Sandy and her guilt or innocence. I never talked about her guilt or her innocence. I gave you the bare facts of the case and uh, used it as an example of what happens if under the Code Napoleon. Well, anyway. Um, the second thing that uh, came to mind about that was in a discussion and a video about the presumption of innocence, hundreds, literally hundreds of you left comments that she was guilty. Again, I never spoke to her guilt or innocence. And it wasn't about her guilt or innocence, but hundreds of you denied her the presumption of innocence, stating emphatically that she was guilty, 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 100% guilty. Some of you even made up, conjured up motives for her crime. <laughs> I, anyway, enough said except that I'm going to give you the rest of the story. Now, the bare bones of the story, which led you in your human nature to decide that she was guilty without presuming that she was innocent, the bare facts that I gave you in the last video were a lady uh, got a person to come to her house with a floor polisher and polish her marble floors. He left, went up the street to talk to a friend, uh, left his um, 
floor polisher outside on the sidewalk and uh, she went out to find him to get him to do a little bit more and uh, he came back he didn't uh, get the floor polish he just got his pickup drove away and reported it stolen and she was subsequently many months later um, arrested and uh, put on probation and had to show up to court every Monday morning those were and oh and then she got out of that by paying several thousands of dollars to the judge those were the bare facts that I gave you and again, I never talked to her innocence or her guilt. But here's the assumptions that people made. A, she's guilty. B, she never called him to try to get his to get him to come and get her thing, his his machine. Uh, that she bribed the judge. I didn't say any of those things. Here's the rest of the story. And I didn't say those things because it wasn't about her guilt or innocence or what she did. It was about what happens to you if you are charged with a crime under Napoleonic law. Here's the rest of the story that you didn't get before you decided she was guilty and denied her the presumption of innocence as is mandated by law. <laughs> uh, he polished the floors. He did a great job. She wanted him to do a little bit more in one of the corners. And she brought his machine back into the house. Now, some of you decided that uh, it was, the pickup was all the way out in the street, a long driveway or a long sidewalk, like it is in many places and neighborhoods in the United States, and that she had to drag that big heavy machine all the way back from the street sidewalk to her house. What are you talking that... to? <laughs> I'm talking to my friends. <laughs> There's no long sidewalks in Ahihik where in the neighborhood where this happened. The sidewalks are literally this wide, and the street is here and her door is here, and the machine is here. She moved this machine maybe three feet. The pickup's like three, four feet from her door. Here's some more. She left the door open. Her motive was not to steal the machine. Her motive was to get him to talk to her, and maybe, now I'm just making an, uh, uh, an assumption, but maybe she thought dragging it back in the house. Now, she, she moved it about three feet, dragging it back into the house. Maybe she thought she was doing him a favor. Anyway, door was open. He had to walk past the door to get to his pickup. All he had to do was look in the house. It was sitting right there in front of the door in plain sight. Why didn't he get it? Question number one. Question number two. Everybody assumed that she could have just fixed this problem by calling him. Why didn't she call him? I got hundreds of comments. Why didn't she just call him and tell him to come get his machine? Tell him where it was. I don't know why he didn't. But I do know that he rather immediately filed a police report for the theft of his machine. Now, why didn't she call him to come get it? She did. She called him multiple times. In the beginning, he said he would come and get it. After that, he's like not responsive. Why didn't he come back and get his machine? Now, again, I don't know. I don't know who the judge was. I don't know the guy with the floor polisher. I don't know his name. I never met him. I know nothing about him other than this story. But I do know the lady, and the lady would have paid him to come and do some extra stuff. She probably would have tipped him extra. That's the kind of lady she was. She wasn't a Karen, as somebody said, who was trying to do him dirty and unhappy with his work, so she wanted to punish him. That was one of the motives that somebody made up. This was a nice lady. 
She had no intention of stealing his machine. Pulled it in through the front door, left it in plain sight with the door open. He got in his pickup and drove away. Do you suppose it's possible that he and the judge and the police decided that she was worth more money in this predicament than the machine was worth? And why would I come up with that idea? Because he refused, or I shouldn't say refused, he agreed to do it but never did, never did come back for his machine. After months and months and months after she was arrested and going to court to report every Monday morning, she finally got the machine back. Now, it, it was over a year that it sat in her living room before she gave it away. Didn't sell it. Gave it to a, a guy who wanted it. She got it back and the guy still wouldn't come and get his machine. Why not? because she was worth more money in this negotiation. And by the way, did we bribe the judge? That settlement was arranged by her attorney and it was characterized as a fine. Well, I am going to now give you my opinion, which I never did before, about whether she was guilty or innocent. I think, technically, she was guilty by her actions. But I'm not a lawyer. I believe that guilt sometimes requires intent. Her intent was never to take the machine. Her intent was to get him to do a little bit more work and probably, undoubtedly in my opinion, pay him extra. But she was worth a lot of money as a defendant, both to the judge and, oh, was justice served to the guy who lost the machine? I'm pretty sure he got his cut. And her lawyer, who knows how much of a cut he got. Anyway, guilty or innocent, neither until it's proven. And again, same advice as I gave you in the other video. Don't get in trouble in Mexico or anywhere else for that matter. <laughs> I'm going to move on from that. Got another thing bothering me today. <sighs> Took a deep breath. <laughs> what else is on my mind today? There's something that uh, bothers me a little. Well, I stopped that video. It was part two of that video was about what was bothering me. And I did a little bit more research about what was bothering me. And I decided to make a whole video of it because it's important. I'll give you a little preview of what my next video will be. What bothers me is that I see all of these um, uh, channels on YouTube who say, oh, you can get an apartment at the beach for $400 a month, or you can live on two fifty dollars a month uh, rent out there in that part of Mexico, or uh, oh, my budget was $1,800 a month, or I live on $1,500 a month in Mexico. Oh, I have Social Security of $1,200 a month, and I live a very good life in Mexico. I'm not saying that's not true. It's true. But in order to get temporary or permanent residency, it costs a lot more than that, and you have to prove that you have this income. So if you only have $1,000 worth of uh, Social Security to live on in Mexico, but you want to move to Mexico and get a better life, good plan, except to get temporal residency, temporary residency, in 2023 it costs, you have to prove that you have over $3,000 a month in income. Or for permanent, permanente, permanent residency, you have to prove over $5,000 a month in income. So how are you going to come down here and live on your $1,000 a month if you don't have $3,000 a month in income. 
That's what bothers me. But in doing a little bit more research, I found out that there are a number of ways to get past that, to get around that requirement of financial solvency. And I'm not talking about 15 years ago on the old FM3 system where um, you used to be able to, to have $1,000 in a Mexican bank account and take it out every month, put it back in every month, take it out every month, put it back in every month, <laughs> or do it a couple of times a month, and it would you would kite your monthly income that way. I'm not talking about sketchy things like that. There are legal ways to get around the financial requirements for temporary residency in Mexico. I'll make that my whole video next week. See you then. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up. And please subscribe and hit that little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed what was on my mind today.